This talk will be an informal survey of complex rational surfaces. So we will start by giving a few obvious examples. So the most obvious examples of rational surfaces are the projective plane and P1 cross P1. So we recall a rational surface is anything birational to the projective plane, and it's kind of obvious that these two both are. Um, next, we can look at non-singular hypersurfaces in P3 and try and figure out which of them are rational. Well, first of all, degree one surfaces are trivially rational because they're all just hyperplanes which are isomorphic to P2. If we look at degree two hypersurfaces, these are also rational, but it's you have to sort of think for a few seconds to see this. So they're given by the zeros of some sort of quadric, uh, which can be put into the form Wx equals yz. And these are in fact isomorphic to P1 cross P1. Um, and this is not difficult to see. For instance, we could take coordinates of P1 cross P1 and map this to say A, B, A, sorry, C, D, um, a, C, B, D, which is W, X, Y, Z. And you can see that this gives an isomorphism from P1 cross P1 to this conic. So that's easy. Degree three is much more subtle. These are also rational, um, but it's much less easy to see it. These are the famous cubic surfaces, um, which have 27 lines on. This is a famous result due to Cayley and Salmon, and is almost the first non-trivial result of high dimensional algebraic geometry. Um, anyway, these turn out to be isomorphic to P2 blown up at six points. Um, so I'm going to discuss these quite a lot more later on in the talk um, after finishing off a few examples of rational surfaces. Um, you might ask what happens for degree four and above. Um, well, degree four or greater than or equal to four are not rational. Degree four turn out to be the famous K3 surfaces, or at least some of them, and degree five and above are surfaces of general type in the Cadera in Reek classification. Anyway, before discussing cubic surfaces in more detail, um, let's just give a few more examples of rational surfaces. Um, these are the, what I'm going to discuss are the hits of Brook surfaces. And these surfaces are the surfaces that are projective um, P1 bundles over P1. So the surface maps to P1 and its fibers are all copies of P1. Um, and you can get any projective P1 bundle by taking a, a two-dimensional vector bundle, and the two-dimensional vector bundles over P1 are all of the form OM plus ON, where this is uh, stands for Sayre's usual twisted sheaf. Um, and if we twist this by a line bundle, then it doesn't change the P1 bundle we get, and we can swap M and N. So we may as well assume that it's of the form O0, plus O n for n greater than or equal to zero, because every Hirzebruck surface is isomorphic to one of these. And um, they're named Hirzebruck surfaces because Hirzebruck had a paper where he carefully discussed them and worked out their topology and so on. Um, actually, they were well known before Hirzebruck studied them, but um, mathematical objects are never named after the person who first studied them, so whatever. Anyway, so we get this family of Hirzebruck surfaces for n equals 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. And the one for n equals 0, you're just taking the trivial bundle, so that's just isomorphic to P1 cross P1. Um, the surface for n equals 1 turns out to be P2 blown up at one point. So it's got a map to P2. Um, with fiber, uh, a copy of P1. Um, and you remember we said last lecture that any surface is um, obtained from a minimal surface by blowing up in a number of points. Well, the minimal rational surfaces are 
these ones. They're the Hitzebrook surfaces apart from this Hitzebrook surface, which can be blown down to P2. So these are the minimal rational surfaces. Um, the minimal rational surfaces, I think, were first classified by the Caro in about 1948 or so. Um, so any surface can be obtained by blowing up one of these. Um, however, it can usually be obtained by blowing up one of these in many different ways because these surfaces are all related. Um, each surface can be obtained from the previous one by blowing up a point and then blowing down a line. Um, so each of these surfaces has a zero section and if you blow up a point in the zero section, you kind of go up one direction. And if you blow up a point that's not in the zero section, you go in the other direction. So um, the, the, all these Hertzbrook surfaces are all quite closely related. Um, incidentally, this shows that we can get from P2 to P1 cross P1 by blowing up two points and then blowing down a point. And that's the example we discussed um, in the previous lecture. Um, I'm not going to go through the remaining examples because um, those are not too dissimilar from the example we did. Um, anyway, um, so um, now what we want to do is to look at um, the relation between cubics, cubic surfaces and um, P2 with six points blown up. Well, first of all, we're going to look at the problem. What happens if you blow up endpoints on P2, what do you get? Here I'm going to take the endpoints to be in general position. So what does general position means mean? Well, what general position means is that I'm being lazy and can't be bothered to write down the exact conditions that these points should satisfy. This was very common in algebraic geometry in the early part of the 20th century, and it's very annoying trying to read papers because you never actually know what the theorems are stating because they've always got this annoying general position condition in there. Anyway, what we're going to do is we look at the space of cubics through these endpoints. And the first question is why cubics? rather than degree four curves or whatever. Well, it turns out this is related to the fact that cubics are essentially sections related to sections of the anti-canonical bundle. So you remember any non-singular variety has a canonical bundle, which is the highest exterior power of its cotangent bundle, and the anti-canonical bundle is the dual of that. So, um, And... Um, um, normally, you embed varieties by using the canonical bundle, but that doesn't work so well for rational surfaces. So instead, people use the anti-canonical bundle. And this is high dimensions. These are th things where you embed using the anti-canonical bundle are closely related to things called Fano varieties, which is a measure to Del Pezzo surfaces. Anyway, we need to work out what is the dimension of the space of cubics. Well, a typical cubic is going to look like some a300 x cubed plus a210 x squared y plus all the way down to plus a003 z cubed. And you see there are 10 coefficients. Um, and this uh, gives you a nine dimensional projective space of cubics. And you remember, if we've got a, a space of cubics, then we get a, a, a birational map from P2 to some projective space. Um, it's, um, except it may not be defined at a few points because um, our space of sections might vanish, might, might all vanish at some given point. But generally, if we get an n-dimensional space of cubics, we will get a map from the projective plane to n minus one dimensional projective space, except it might not be defined at a few points. And you, but you can make it defined by blowing up these points. So, um, um, so generally speaking, what will happen if we blow up n points? 
where we can take n to be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and so on. Now, if we block more than if we have more than nine points in general position, then there will be no cubics at all through those nine points. That, that's one of the conditions that general position means. Of course, there are some sets of 10 points that do lie in a cubic, but most of them don't. So um, if we look at the cubics through these n points, then we will get a map, a rational map from P2 to P9, P8, P7, P6, P5, P4, P3, P2, or P1, or P0, which is a point. So we get a map to this. And its degree will be 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, or 0. Um, in fact, it's one of the conditions for del Pezzo surfaces is it should have a degree m, n embedding into n-dimensional projective space, except the, 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 these ones at the bottom are a bit funny because they, they don't actually give you embeddings, but anyway. And we can say what these are. Well, well first of all, this one is the Veronese embedding. So um, the Veronese surface usually means a, de a, a, a degree, an embedding of P2 into P5 defined by looking at quadrics. But instead of looking at quadrics, you can use cubics and then you get an embedding into P9. And you could use quartics or high degree curves if you want to. But the, 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 this is sort of just an analogous to to the, the, the usual Veronese surface, so it's well understood. This one turns out to be the Hirzebruck surface, or its image is the Hirzebruck surface H1 that we mentioned before. Um, this is the one we're going to discuss in more detail. It's the famous degree three embedding into P3. Um, as you can see, it's really part of a family of degree N embeddings into Pn. Um, so this is the cubic surface. Um, this one also has a name. It's called a segre surface and turns out to be an intersection of two quadrics in uh, P4. Um, so these things here are the famous del Pezzo surfaces, if I pronounce the Italian right. Except the definition of del Pezzo surface is a bit fuzzy about these ones here. Not everyone agrees about whether or not these cases here count as del Pezzo surfaces. Um, so, uh, um, so now let's look at the case of cubic surfaces a bit more and ask why does a cubic surface have 27 lines on it. Well, I'm going to cheat a bit here because I'm, I'm going to, I'm not going to answer why a cubic surface has 27 lines on it. I'm going to answer why a projected plane blown up in six points has 27 lines on it. And showing that's a cubic surface is, uh, takes a little bit of work. So first of all, what are these lines? Well, these lines turn out to be exceptional curves. So you remember these are exceptional curves, are curves E with self-intersection number minus one and E rational. So let's look at P2 blown up at six points. And let's find exceptional curves on it. Well, it obviously has six exceptional curves. at least six exceptional curves, um, given by the blow-ups of these points. Well, six is rather less than 27, so there must be some other exceptional curves um, on this. Well, we saw some of them in the previous lecture. Suppose we take two of these points that we blew up and we take a line through them. And if we blow these up, these exceptional points become little copies of P1 that I'll draw like that. And the inverse image of this curve consists of a line together with these two exceptional curves. And if we call this line L, 
then we saw last time that the intersection number of this line with itself is one, which is the intersection of this line with itself, minus one, minus one. So the, these are the self-intersection numbers of these two exceptional curves, E1 and E2. Um, so we can get another exceptional curve by taking two of the six points we blew up and drawing a line through them. So let's see what happens. Well, we've got six points. So we just draw a line through two of them and there are, uh, how many ways to doing that? Well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So uh, this gives us an extra 15 exceptional curves. So how many have we got? Well, we've got six plus 15, equals 21 exceptional curves so far, and there ought to be 27. So we're still missing six of them. So where can we find these other six exceptional curves? Well, we can do it like this. Um, what we do is we take five points that we blow up, one, two, three, four, five, and let's take a conic through them. And this is easy to do because if we've got any five points in the plane, there's a, there's, there's a, well, any five points in general position, there, there's a unique conic through them. So um, let's see what happens if we blow this up. Well, we get five exceptional curves and we get the inverse image of the conic, which turns out to be um, a curve with self-intersection number, well, we, well, the conic has self-intersection number four with itself because any two conics intersect in two points if they're in general position. So the self-intersection number is going to be four minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one, which is equal to minus one. So we found another exceptional curve given by taking um, a conic through five of the points we blow up and take looking at its inverse image. So, so let's count the number of points, exceptional curves we've got. We've got six coming from the um, points, and we've got 15 coming from lines through two points, and we've got six which come from conics through five because there are there are six ways of choosing five points of our original six points and if we add these up we find there are indeed now 27 um, exceptional curves that we've found um, well at least 27 in fact there aren't any more but i'm feeling too lazy to show that um, well we can um, look at what happens for other numbers of blown up points so let's blow up of P2 in N points and ask how many exceptional curves are there? So here we can take N to be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And let's count the number of exceptional curves we get. Well, first of all, we can get some exceptional curves just from these um, points. So these come from the blown up points. And then we got some exceptional curves by taking two of these points and drawing a line through them. So we need to count the number of ways of picking two points out of this. And the number is 0, 0, 1, 3, uh, 6, 10, 15, 21, 28, 36 and so on. So these come from a line through two points. I'm going to indicate this as two, one, one, meaning um, it's, uh, sorry, one, 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 meaning it's a line of degree one passing through two points. We'll see what this notation means a little bit later. Um, next, I can take a conic through five points. And the number of ways of doing that is the number of ways of choosing five of these points. And obviously that's zero until we have at least five points. And then it's the number of ways of choosing five out of this number of points, which looks like one, six, uh, 21, 
56, um, 84, I think, and so on. Um, so um, then we can get the total number of blown up points. So we get zero, so, sorry, the total number of exceptional curves goes zero, one, three, six, 10, 16, 27. But, um, you know, I said there were no extra exceptional curves when we blow up six points, but in fact, there are some other ways of getting exceptional curves when we, when we blow up seven or more. Um, so uh, so let, let, let's mention some of the ways you can get more points by blowing, if you've got seven points blown up. Well, what we can do is we can take a cubic Um, through seven points, one of which is one of which it passes through doubly. So I'm going to indicate this as three, two, one, 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 one. Um, sorry, I, I forgot to indicate. I was I was drawing a conic through five points as two, one, 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 one. Um, so. Um, if, if, if you check, um, this is self-intersection nine minus the sum of these squares, um, which is nine minus four minus six, which is minus one. And you can also check that it's a rational curve by using something called the adjunction formula. Anyway, you see there are seven ways of doing this. So we should add another seven here. Um, and there are 56 ways of doing it for degree eight. And there are 252 ways of doing it for degree nine. Um, now, uh, that turns out to be all the exceptional curves if you blow up seven points. So we get 56 here, which is seven plus 21 plus 21 plus seven. Degree eight, things get even more complicated. So, um, so for degree eight, we also get degree four curves um, passing through um, eight points, three of them with of degree passing through as a, as a double point. So I'm going to indicate that by this notation. And if you count up, we get 56 of these. We can also get degree five curves, which pass through five points with degree two and three with degree one, if I've got it right. And you can check there are 28 of these. Um, and um, you can also get uh, degree six curves um, passing through um, one point with degree three and the others with degree two. One, two, three, five, six, seven. Hang on, uh, one of these seems to be wrong. Um, I think maybe that should be six twos. I'm not quite sure about it. Put a question mark there. Um, and there are eight of these. So if you add them up, you get eight plus 28 plus 56 plus 56 plus 56 plus 28 plus eight, which is equal to 240. Um, now for degree nine, this process goes on forever and you actually get an infinite number of exceptional curves. So we've got this rather funny sequence here. One, three, six, 10, 16, 27, 56, 240, infinity. Well, if you've studied Lie groups and Lie algebras, you may recognize this because these are dimensions, 240 is the number of roots of the exceptional Lie algebra E8. 56 and 27 are the dimensions of the minuscule representations of E7 and E6. This is the dimension of the spin representation of D5. Um, this is the, um, and this sort of corresponds to, what's the next one, A4, and these correspond to A2, A1, and so on. So um, um, this coincidence is not actually a coincidence at all, as I will now explain. And I also want to explain what this funny notation um, here means. So what's going on? Well, um, what we do is we look at the Picard group of the surface blown up in n points. So the Picard group is the group of degree zero divisors um, modulo 
um, linear equivalence. And for a surface blown up at n points, it's not very difficult to work out what it is. It's just z to the n plus 1. And the Picard group also has a bilinear form on it given by intersections. And the intersection actually makes this into a Lorentzian space. So, so if we've got a point x0, um, x1 up to xn in z to the n plus 1, it is norm x0 squared minus x1 squared minus x2 squared and so on. Where these sort of are related to the fact that an exceptional curve has self-intersection number minus 1. So... Um, um, now, the canonical divisor on this turns out to be divisor 3, 1, 1, and so on, 1. So it is norm is 3 squared minus n. And you notice that when n hits 9, which was where things went wrong here, um, the norm actually becomes 0. So this is greater than 0 for n less than 9, equal to 0 for n equals 9, and less than 0 for n greater than 9, which is, as we'll see in a moment, it's why the number of exceptional curves suddenly becomes infinite here. Um, and now an exceptional curve is um, um, comes from an element of the Picard group. So it comes from an element x0, x1, up to xn of the Picard group. And RR is equal to minus 1. So x0 squared minus x1 squared and so on minus xn squared is equal to minus 1. And because the curve is rational, um, if you use an adjunction formula, this turns out to imply that it has um, in a product one with the canonical divisor. So what we're doing is we're looking at norm minus one vectors that are in a product one with the canonical divisor. Now, if we draw this as Lorentzian space. Now, if the canonical divisor has positive norm, it sort of lives in here somewhere and its orthogonal complement is positive definite and therefore only has a finite number of vectors of norm one. So this is why we only get a finite number of exceptional curves if the canonical divisor has positive norm. And we can, we can write out these vectors R, which have norm minus one and inner product one with the canonical divisor. So they can look like naught here um, and then minus one somewhere and noughts elsewhere. So, these were the ones corresponding to the exceptional curves, or it can have been a product one with k and have two ones somewhere, or it can have been a product two with k and have five ones somewhere and zeros elsewhere, or it could have been a product three with k and a two and uh, six ones and so on. So this is where all these funny um, vectors come from, they really represent elements of the Picard group that have norm minus one and inner product one with the canonical divisor. So we only get a finite number of them if the canonical divisor has um, positive norm, but we get an infinite number as soon as the canonical divisor has negative norm. Um, now for the relation with exceptional Lie algebras, it turns out that if we take the space Z the 1 plus n with norm x0 squared minus x1 squared minus xn squared. And we take the canonical divisor 3, 1, 1, and so on, and take its orthogonal complement. Um, now, if we take n less than or equal to 8, then this is positive definite. And when I say positive definite, what I mean is negative definite, because I always get muddled up about the sign of this. And this turns out to be a certain lattice. It's the lattice E8, E7, E6, D5, A4, A2, A1, and something else, when n is equal to 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3. So these are the root lattices of various Lie algebras. Um, so what is the root lattice E8? Well, in fact, about the easiest way to construct it is simply to define E8 
as the orthogonal complement of this vector in um, Lorentzian space. Um, you might want to change sign if you want E8 to be positive definite rather than negative definite. Um, and um, the vectors R with R squared equals minus one and R k equals one um, turn out to be usually weight um, vectors of the weights of a certain representation of E8, E7, E6, and so on. So for E7 and E6, we get 56 or 27 um, vectors like this, which correspond to the 56 and 27 dimensional vectors of the Lie algebra E6. So the 27 lines on a cubic surface actually correspond to a basis for a certain representation of E6. Um, and this gives you other um, relations. For example, the vial group of E6 acts on the 27 um, weight spaces of this representation. It also acts as an automorphism group of the configuration of 27 lines on a cubic surface. Um, similarly, um, here we get 240 vectors, which are um, that they're not quite um, the weight spaces of a representation. Instead, they're the roots of E8. And you can see this because if R squared is minus one and RK equals one, then R plus K um, um, has, um, so, so, so K has norm um, one. So R plus K is going to have norm minus two. Um, that wasn't quite right. Should take R minus k as norm minus two. So these correspond to the minus two vectors in the E8 lattice, which are just the roots of E8. Um, so I'll just finish by saying that if you want to find out more about this, there's a very nice book by Manin about this on um, cubic forms, which is mostly about cubic surfaces. And He's got lots of chapters on the, well, he's got a very weird chapter on Mufang loops to start off with. I don't really know why, but he's, he's got several chapters on the, he's got a chapter on the 27 lines where he explains the relation with exceptional curves and vial groups in much more detail. Okay, I think I'll leave it at that for today.